Newtonian spaces. So I'll start with some um, rather classical story and then we'll try to tell you something that we're working on now. And uh, I'll end with uh, some speculations about the relation to physics. As everybody is trying to do, we'll see how successful it will be. So, um, so the first part, let me recall the definition of so-called Hamiltonian G spaces. So let's say G is a compact connected group. So it's a Lie algebra is calligraphic G. And let's say M is a G manifold. So then um, we give the following definition. We look at the following triple this G manifold. The two form on M. And a map from M to the do of the algebra, uh, which uh, satisfy the following conditions. So, so, right. so the first condition is M omega is symplectic, so D omega is zero, and omega is non-degenerate. So uh, the map mu we want it to be equivariant. under the quad joint action. And the third condition, probably the most important or the most interesting, the so-called moment map condition. So the contraction of omega is a fundamental vector field. Is exact. And here x is an element of G and xm is the corresponding vector field. So what's good about this definition? So this definition is relatively complicated, there are many conditions, but this definition is very, very, very successful in the following sense. So uh, maybe I just very briefly list the consequences. There are uh, four main consequences of this definition. So the first one is called reduction. So if you take the level set of some element of star and divide by the action of the G star stabilizer of that element. So this space is symplectic. So the other consequence if M is compact Then the image of M divided by the quadjoint action, you can think of it as a subset of some vector space. And it is convex, a convex polypore.
So then the uh, third um, statement, let me say that the dimension of M is to M. Then integrals of type, you take the Liouville form of omega and you multiply it by the function given by the exponential of the uh, pairing of mu of m with this fixed element x of the Lie algebra. So the, those integrals localize. So can be reduced to a typically much smaller space of uh, t fixed points in M where t is a maximum force. And finally, there is the Gilman Sternberg principle, which goes under the name that quantization commutes with reduction. And I, 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 I don't want to speak about it today. All right, so, so these are, this is a kind of classical theory, very, very beautiful, and you see, right, four, like each, each of those four consequences, that's a very strong big theorem. So, uh, so this definition has those consequences. And the um, natural question is whether there are other situations, whether one can generalize in various directions uh, this story. So this is a classical story, but now uh, can, can one go beyond and uh, find some other situations where the such, um, such things uh, work? And one question is, can one do it for some infinite dimensional groups or infinite dimensional manifolds or spaces? Uh -huh. So, in fact, um, if you think of infinite dimensional groups, there are more or less two reasonable types of infinite dimensional groups. These are gauge groups and diffeomorphism groups. Um, now, uh, just a remark. So, um, for gauge groups, consider Loops, so spaces of maps from S1 to G. Then, if G is I described before, uh, those loop groups fit into a short exact sequence where S1 is a circle. So they admit some some kind of canonical central extension by the circle and. So this group is also known as a gauge group, this central extension. And uh, one can ask the question whether one can develop a similar theory for those central extensions. And uh, in the end of 1990s, Manrankin and Woodward Uh, develop the theory of LG hat Newtonian spaces. And that theory, it was not obvious right from the start, but eventually, over, over the years, in, in that theory, all of those statements, they were developed, proved, established. So, so more or less, this theory has everything which is promised in, uh, in this list. So, um, and in principle, it, 
probably would be useful to tell you a little bit about how it works. But uh, uh, then preparing the talk, I tried to, to, to measure a little bit the time. And uh, frankly, I think it doesn't fit. So that, that, that's why we jump uh, directly to the topic of the talk. And as I said, there are two reasonable types of infinite dimensional groups, gauge groups and diffeomorphism groups. So what about diffeomorphism groups? So that's what we will be uh, discussing today. Now, as, as, as you see, Myron, Kill, and Woodward, they, they took not an arbitrary gauge group. They took a gauge group which corresponds to the circle. That's because in dimension one, everything is much easier. Who knows, maybe there are similar stories or more complicated stories in other dimensions, possibly, maybe, but uh, we'll be interested also for diffeomorphism groups in dimension one. So actually there are not that many. Um, so uh, the group that we'll be interested in, let's start with the following gadget. Let me denote it by uh, one more beautiful G. Um, so this will be orientation preserving different morphisms of the circle and more exactly its universal cover. So uh, what are those? So these are maps from real line to, to itself. So the derivative is positive. And it's quasi-periodic in the following sense. f of x plus 2 pi is f of x plus 2 pi. So um, again, um, uh, there is a unique so-called universal robot. Central extension. So it's a, a unique non trivial central extension um, by the circle. Um, in principle, one can describe it explicitly, but I will do it in a somewhat implicit way because it, it, it suits better to my purposes. So um, maybe, even though, of course, right, it's an infinite dimensional group, but uh, it has a Lie algebra. And Lie, this Lie algebra consists of pairs. So the first element of a pair is, of course, a vector field on the circle. And The second element of the pair is a real number. So the Lie bracket looks as follows. So for two pairs, UA and VB. So the first element over here is just a Lie bracket, Lie bracket in, in, in the sense of vector fields of U and V. And here you have an integral always one of U of X times V, uh, the third derivative of V dx. And that's called the Garten Fuchs cross cycle. Now, uh, of course, we are interested in the dual. Um, so I, I should say that. Of course, if you look at real topological dual, that's some huge thing, unmanageable. So what, what I will be writing here is a so-called smooth 
dual. So here my kind of cheating starts and it will continue and grow in some way. Um, so what, what is it? So this is again a space of pairs. The first element of the pair is a so-called quadratic differential. So it's a tensor on the real line, which transforms as dx squared. And the second element is again a real number. And the duality is organized in the following way. So this is an integral of t times u. And notice that this is a quadratic differential. Uh, a vector field, you can think of it as a minus 1 differential. So the product is uh, naturally a differential. So it's actually a natural quantity that you can integrate. Plus kc. Um, an important thing for us is the core joint action. G hat, you can imagine that this is a pair of a diffeomorphism and uh, a point on the circle, right? A point on the circle we can think of as a complex number. Um, and now we are interested where such an element sends a pair CC, right? So, um, it turns out that nothing depends on Z. It's, it's, it's center, it's an element of a center, so Z disappears in the action. So, and TF is equal to the following interesting expression. So, this, this is an action of diffeomorphisms. So, first of all, we act by diffeomorphisms on a function. And then there is a square of the derivative. That you can see why, because that's a quadratic differential. So that's how the corresponding tensor should transform. And then there is plus C times S of F. I'll explain now what S of F is. And then actually C doesn't change. Now, um, I don't know how many, but I think that there are, there are people in the audience who don't know what S of F is, hopefully, because uh, it's an, it's, it, I think it's going to be a shock and surprise and whatever. Like I'll write now the expression for S of F. Of course, unfortunately, many of you know what S of F is. Then for you, uh, it's less interesting. So that's a surprising and interesting expression, which is called Schwartz and derivative. Um, notice that uh, I have denominators, but all those denominators, they are proportional to f prime, and my f prime is always non-zero. It's actually positive, but in particular, it's non-zero. Now, uh, I like giving exercises during the talks. Of course, I don't know, whatever, whatever you like, you can uh, take it or you can refuse it. But for some of you, it certainly should be interesting. So here is, here is an exercise. So 
will show that this is indeed an action, right? How I write it is certainly it's 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 far from obvious. Who knows? Maybe this is an action, right? But when you add this gadget, why should it be an action? What's the composition? Or, or how did I compose that? The, oh, the, 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 the composition. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's a good point. But you see, since the central line, of course, the, the composition, uh, it has a complicated feature on the, central, on the central circle. But since the central circle doesn't act, the composition for Fs is just a naive composition of maps. So it's not, it's not, uh, there is no difficulty on that part. The only difficulty is uh, with, uh, with this S of F. Okay. So now I'm... trying to give a definition which mimics which mimics the definition of uh, Hamiltonian spaces we had in the beginning. So, again, a triple. So we will have some kind of space with an action of G and uh, capital Omega two form on N and the map mu to, to this space Lee G hat store. So what is um is a great sort of Italian space. Well, so uh, we want d omega to be zero. Yes. G acting or G hat? Well, I, I prefer to have G acting, or if you want, G hat acting with a central line, a central circle acting trivially. You see, it's similar to what happened up there. So, um, as I said, this is a work in progress, and maybe I should uh, stress the points which are really, at the moment, not completely decided. You see, uh, when you speak about infinite dimensional say, spaces, you, you should really decide what does it mean. And uh, in particular, depending on that, the notion of non-degeneracy needs to be negotiated. So for a moment, let's, uh, let's not pay too much attention to it. But have in mind that in principle here, I, it, it's not like here you, you, you need to say what kind of uh, manifold, say, it is. Is it a Banach manifold? Is it a Frechet manifold? Is it a logical space? I mean, one, one needs to, to say something about it. Um, so then, uh, we want the uh, um, moment map to be activarian. Under the action that I described above, Uh, so we want a moment map equation so for all u in li of g or li of g hat if you want and of course here as before u n is that the field? Is that the field on M? Maybe one more thing I should say. So related to, 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 to the fact that 
it's all infinite dimensional. So maybe let me write a, a very strong condition, but uh, uh, we'll see a, a little bit later whether, whether it's actually a good condition that's, that, that's not, not completely clear. So you typically want to require something about mu, maybe something like mu is proper, or maybe something a bit, a bit weaker than that. We'll, we'll see some examples where it is, it is proper or it is not proper. So, uh, so there are some things which are not completely fixed in this definition, but otherwise, so that's a definition which very much resembles the definition in the classical case. So now the question is whether this definition has all the good properties. Uh, to be honest, uh, I do not know. But I'll show you at least some things that we know about this definition. And then some things that we hope to be true about this definition. Okay. So let me... Um, let me perhaps uh, mention that um, there are some obvious examples where this definition applies. Uh, so I will now give you a set of examples and then uh, towards the end of the talk I will add more examples which are in some way more interesting. But the obvious examples where all this is uh, satisfied are quadrant orbits. So this means we consider the orbit of a point TC in the dual and this is simply simply this space and it more or less obviously by construction for free satisfies all the axioms in particular Mu is simply the uh, inclusion into um, into this smooth dual. So we have at least some set of examples to start with, uh, but we'll see a little bit more examples later. So now let me formulate the main result that we have up to now. It will need some notation and it will also need a little bit of uh, explanation. So first of all, let me denote by H the group PSL to R and by H tilde it's universal cover or you can say a universal cover of SO2R so uh, H naturally acts on a one dimensional projective space R1 and this is more or less the same as a circle. And then H tilde, so this action will lift to an action of H tilde on the real line. Uh, and now I would like to, um, to define some kind of relatively, so up to now everything was very, very standard. But now I, I would like to define some relatively exotic, or I, I don't know, maybe for you somewhat exotic object. Uh, a positive part of this uh, um, H tilde and this is um, the set of elements uh, such that there is um, a point on the real line with the image which is to the right of that point. So it, roughly speaking, 
So this uh, H tilde plus is more or less like half of F of H tilde, roughly speaking. We'll, we'll get back to, to this question a little bit later. So now here is a theorem. one-to-one correspondence between those Eurosor of Hamiltonian spaces And the following gadgets. So we have spaces with an action of the group H. So this is PSL to R. Uh, so these are spaces which carry into form and which. Uh, Equipped with a map which lands in H tilde plus. And those spaces, they have the following properties. Some of you probably know quite a lot about them. So these are quasi Hamiltonian. H spaces, but let me uh, let me just state the axioms. So on this side, so d omega is non-zero. Instead, it's a pullback of some. Maybe I should write h of some explicitly given three form. Uh, on H tilde or on H, as as you like, right? This this form uh, pullbacks from H to H tilde. So there is some some kind of non-degeneracy condition that I don't want to state. Uh, so uh, it's again equivalent. Uh, so phi of H M. Uh, is given by the uh, um, conjugation action. And notice, right, so I, I, I live in H tilde, right, but I write a conjugation action for H, but uh, it is well defined because the adjoint or conjugation action of the center, it's trivial, so in fact the conjugation action descends to, to the action of H. So it is it is actually well defined right hand side. And finally Yota XM omega is also equal to some kind of funny funny expression. Maybe for those who have never seen it let me sorry that was H. X. So let me still write it. Okay, so um, so um, that's uh, that, that's I would say for now is the main result and now I'll yeah. Wait a question, so do you suppose that C is equal to one in that? Yeah, I suppose that C yeah. So the series, right, for different non-zero C's, they are more or less the same. So, yeah, we, we assume C is non-zero and we can normalize it. 
to be equal to 1. So what I, um, uh, what I want to do in the rest of the talk are three things. Uh, we'll first briefly discuss how uh, this theorem plays for coadjoint orbits. So then I'll give you, in fact, this is a, this is a constructive theorem. So this one-to-one -one correspondence is, is completely constructive. I'll give you that construction. And in the end, I'll give you one more example, which seems to be uh, very much physics related. So first of all, What about quadrant orbits, right? We say there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. So what if uh, uh, we put a quadrant orbit on the left side of that correspondence? The question is, what will be on, on the right side? Um, so maybe, I'm not sure. Let me, let me denote this correspondence somehow, whatever, F. So the question is, what will be f of a quadrant orbit? And it turns out that it will be a conjugacy plus contained in h tilde plus. So, uh, so you, you have this group the uh, universal cover of SL2R. So this is, of course, a finite dimensional group. Uh, you can see the conjugacy classes, and then, roughly speaking, you can see the half of them. So those which are contained in that subset uh, H tilde plus. So in fact, that's, a not, that's not a new theorem. So this, uh, so this theorem, it gives you a classification of uh, quadrant orbits uh, uh, of uh, G. And uh, in fact, this theorem has a rich history. So uh, let me mention some of the names associated to it. So I think, it, it, as far as I know, the first proof is due to Lazutkin and Pankratova. That's uh, in the middle of. 70s, and then uh, after that, there are other big names: Kirillov, Sigel, Witten, and then many, many other names. So there are many papers which are devoted to proving this theorem in great detail from different angles. Uh, for me, there is a kind of uh, personal touch to it because Zutkin was one of my university teachers and Pankratova is, uh, is a mom of a friend. So, uh, <laughs> somehow, uh, so this, but, but uh, like only late, well, much later I learned that these people pioneered the topic and they, they, they gave a first proof like, of course, they, they didn't know any of that language. They didn't use the word quadrant orbits and nothing like that. Right, but they, they did solve the problem. Uh, so, and then like many, many, many other works, I think uh, Kirillov and Sigel, so these were pioneering works already in the modern language and then Witten popularized it for, for, for the physics community. And then, as I say, there are tens of papers discussing it. Um, right. OK. So um, now let me, um, let me say some words about the, uh, about the construction. because it's also quite interesting. So as I say, the construction is explicit. So we take one space and we produce the other space.
So let's consider the following space. Let's call it D. And that's the, sp the space of maps from the real line to RP1, so to the circle, such that the derivative is always positive. And there is an element of PSL2R such that gamma of x plus 2 pi is h acting on gamma of x. So these are, these are the maps which are in some way quasi-periodic and they are always like increasing. So they always go in the same direction around the circle. So now, um, this gadget has actions. It carries an action of D. So if you have an element of D, it maps gamma, not surprisingly, to gamma of f of x, right? And it also has an action of h. And this is also just an naive action. So you act on the source and you act on the target. So these are the two actions. These two actions clearly commute. Now, uh, somewhat more interestingly, D is equipped with two maps. And so the first map, let's call it P, is a map to Li of G hat star. And this map works as follows. So, of course, here we have gamma, a map to RP1. And then it turns out that there is a unique seed or T of X, such that my gamma recall is an element of RP1. So I write it as psi1 of X, psi2 of X, where psi i's are solutions of this second order differential equation, which is called in literature, well, I mean, I don't know, if you're a physicist, you should probably call it a Schrodinger equation, but uh, in mathematics it's called Hill equation. And in fact, Lazutkin and Pankratova, they were studying classes of uh, Hill equations under the action of diffeomorphism. Right, so that's the first map, and... So, so it's the pullback of the project with connection, right? From yeah, 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 uh, And the second map... is a map to H tilde plus. So this is actually... This is actually a lift uh, of, uh, you see here we have an element H in PSL2R. So of course each gamma is equipped with, with the H, which ensures quasi-periodicity. It turns out that you can lift it to H tilde and it will turn out that it is in H tilde plus because gamma prime uh, was positive. And here, maybe, uh, I don't want to explain it in detail, but maybe one exercise. 
So suppose that uh, you have a point, uh, a point gamma in, on our P1, and you are thinking that there is a curve, curve in our P1, which at time zero is passing through gamma, and then uh, there is a gamma prime, which is positive, and there is also a gamma double prime. So you know at t equals zero, the value of your map, you know uh, gamma prime and you know gamma double prime. And then suppose at t equal one, you have some other point. So let me say this is zero and this is one. So the derivative is again positive. So then there is a unique PSL to our element which uh, maps all the data to each other. So you apply it to your curve and those data will match for a unique element in PSL 2 r That's of course some um, easy thing. We should probably know it from school or from our projective geometry course. But typically I don't. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you do. So that's the second exercise. And actually that's, uh, that explains why you can lift. So now, uh, how does the construction work? So suppose you, you're given a Verasaurus space. And I'll now explain how to construct a quasi-Hamiltonian space. The only thing I will forget about all those two forms, because that's too technical, that, that, that we sweep under the rug. But uh, at least how, how do you build the space? So um, we define M. So we start by... by the final product of n and z over this Li of g get star. So this is what? This is the space of pairs, n, and here, whatever, t, let's say, 1, such that, uh, sorry, and gamma such that mu of n is equal to phi of gamma. And now you uh, divide it by the diagonal action of G. So you can act on both spaces. It turns out that this condition is preserved by this action. And moreover, you know, on D, you still have an action of H on the other side. And you still have a map to H tilde plus. So that was a map phi, and now that's that what becomes the map phi. So that's, uh, that's how you build a, a triple. So you have an M. You have an action, you have a map to h tilde plus, and I didn't tell you how to construct a two form, but well, sorry about that. So that's in the one direction, and you can now imagine in the opposite direction, if you're given an m, you can build an n. So now you take again g times m over h tilde plus, you now divide it by the diagonal action of h, and d, sorry, maybe I should have written m times d, and d still has an action of uh, this beautiful g,
and it has a map to Leo Jihad star. So like uh, the, the reconstruction works symmetrically in both directions. And so you can also, like that's of course where the real work is. You, you need to figure out what to do with two forms, but you can, you can also figure out what to do with two forms. So now let me finish with a speculation about applications of uh, this story to, to physics and for that I'll need a short reminder about um, mobility of flat connections. Of course we already had talks about, about those, this stuff. Um, so suppose that sigma is compact and that oriented to manifold and um, let's say there is a boundary and to simplify things this boundary is just has one connected component. So the boundary is a circle. And on, on, the, on, on this boundary, I choose a base point. So I have something like this. So that's my sigma. Then also let's say G is a connected Lie group. So G is equal to Lie of G. And let's assume, let's say it's all real. And let's assume that it has an invariant So then, um, there is the following theorem. I think the first version is so-called AMM, but then more enlightened versions are due to Lipman Severa and Monsieur Thrive and there are many other many other versions. So um, it says that the space of homomorphisms from the fundamental group of the surface to the group G is a quasi Hamiltonian G space. And uh, suppose you have a point here, a representation, a map from pi 1 to G. Uh, so then let me just tell you what is what is the map phi, right? We are supposed to have a map to the universal curve of G and this map is uh, simply equal to rho of the boundary starting at the, um, at the point, um, at, the, uh, at the base point. And it's easy to see that, well, a priori that's a map to G, but it lifts to a map to, um, to G theory. Right. Okay, very good. Now, um, some facts. Suppose now we take G is equal to H, which is 
PSO2R. So then um, we can build a space, let's call it M. And this is a part of uh, O by one H such that the images of all elements of pi one are hyperbolic. So uh, this space has another name. It's also called the type mirror space of that surface. And uh, closely associated to it is another space. Let's call it M prime. This is M. Divided by the action of the mapping class group of the surface. So this is the moduli space of hyperbolic matrix from sigma. Here we assume that the genus is at least one. Um, and this is also equal to the So now, um, what's the physics application or speculation? So let's consider the space n prime. which is f of m prime. So let's, let's consider m prime, which is this space, and let's associate to it a Virasoro space. Let's call it m prime. So let's recall that this space has a moment map. Uh, which maps it to Lee of G hat star. So, uh, Conjecturally, and prime is a space associated by Such and to center. The sigma in so called Jakiv Titleborn to the quantum gravity um, so the map mu is a 2d to 1d holographic duality whatever that means right? And finally, I think that's the last. Oh, sorry, yeah. The last formula that I plan to write. And I of T.
uh, an integral with the exponential which corresponds to the simplest vector field. So u simply equal to d over dx, rotations of the circle is the genus g contribution to the partition function. So you see, on those blackboards, basically, the words slowly start losing meaning, or their meaning becomes whatever. They become more exciting, but a lot less clear. So probably that's a good point to stop. Thank you for your attention. All right, so I, uh, I should also chair, right, my <laughs> evacuation <laughs> session, but we can also go for a <laughs> So I, I just have one question. So in the theorem where the, the, the definition started to disappear. Uh, just, you mentioned that at the beginning, well, well, let's just forget about this problem that it's an infinite dimensional manifold, but then the theorem actually... In the theorem, so we would need... We would need. We, so what, what are the technical... Yeah, the I left think... On, on the so let's say, if one... Uh, <clears throat> right. So I think if one uh, is uh, the, the most strict one probably wants uh, mu to be proper, and then, then one can probably figure out what are the non-degeneracy conditions for omega. Omega is certainly like weakly non-degeneracy. No, no, but, but, but this is a theorem, so this, so you know the answer, or you? No, okay. Also, it's, a, it's, it's an inverted comma. It's, a, yeah, it's an inverted it's, 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 comma it's, it's, it's theorem. It's oh, that's yeah, it, There is a theorem of this type. What, what you should you see? What you should put on this side and on that side, it's a little bit a matter of choice. Because, uh, for instance, in the example that I was developing, if you take the uh, space M, the Teichner space, then the symplectic quotients are non-compact. And this means that the map move here will not be proper. So therefore, it's, it's a good example. So if you want to include it, you should uh, replace properness by something weaker. On the other hand, uh, so if you want this space to be included, M prime is not uh, is not a manifold; it has some singularities. So this means that one should also include some uh, so at least some singularities on the other side. So uh, so I think that, that that's a little bit a, a matter a matter of, of choices. What kind of examples you want to admit, and this would tell you. Like what? What are the what are the things that you want to include on both sides? But of course, there will, there will be a correspondence between whatever singularities and non-compactness on the two that you admit on the two sides. So in that in that sense, we don't know yet what's the optimal. What are the optimal requirements? So you you're right. It's theorem. Well, one day hopefully. My other question is so are you. Um, so is this linked to your other other line of work which you yeah of course yeah well of course sure you uh, i mean the uh, this um is it this, this, the, the, so the story of group valid spaces of course can be related for that one needs to apply the Jinford circle of reduction so they are, one can relate them by Jinford uh, I, I sorry i just mentioned the work with samson about uh, or oh uh, the work with samson Sure, because we are trying to make sense of some of those integrals, of mm -hmm. course. Now, uh, these are the integrals that one really wants to compute. And with Samson, we were looking at the integrals for quadjoint orbits. But now, actually, these are the spaces. That, that's a little bit the purpose, of course. So these are the spaces for which you really want to compute those integrals. So yes, so these are two pieces of a puzzle, but then uh, so those integrals, right, I wrote them now in some 
in some form which doesn't make sense. So yes, one wants to make sense of those integrals. Sure. That's right. Okay, well, sorry for kind of dissenting. <laughs>